All right, good afternoon. Please rise and stay standing for the, pres for the presentation of colors, Pledge of Allegiance, and National Anthem. Parade the colors. On behalf of the President and a grateful nation, I present the John Quincy Adams Presidential Birthday Wreath. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, please be seated. I'm Jim Pitosa, President of the Board of Governors of the United First Parish Church, and it is my privilege to represent the board, the staff, congregation, and friends of UFPC in offering you a hearty welcome to our sanctuary. While our numbers today are predictably small, they reflect the slow but steady progress of reopening energy that we see all around us. It is a source of real joy that we reopened our History and Visitors program on July 1st and have seen a steady stream of interested people coming in to explore our historic building and pay respects at the final resting places of the two presidents and most distinguished members of this congregation and their first ladies that lie here. I also want to acknowledge with thanks the president of Senator John Keenan in our audience today. Thank you for being here. It is our custom to gather to celebrate the birthdays of these presidents, a father and a son. Today's ceremony remembers the sun. John Quincy Adams remembered for many reasons, but almost always for his eloquence. Another president of Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy, saw fit to open his book, Profiles in Courage, with an account of John Quincy Adams as a person who put his convictions about the good of the country ahead of the good of his party. 
who believed that conviction and principle must always lead over political expedience. So today, on the occasion of his birthday, we gather as we do every year to remember him, thank him, and consider the complexities of the moments that comprised his lifetime and begin with a recall of his own words to yet again inspire us. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Now it is my pleasure to welcome for our invocation our affiliate community minister, Reverend Dr. Michelle Walsh. Thank you, Jim, and good afternoon. Respecting the diversity of our several traditions, let us join first in the spirit of prayer this morning, this afternoon. God of our faith, who are the source of freedom and the command to equality in respecting the worth and dignity of every human being, as we honor today the life and service of President John Quincy Adams, we give thanks for the founding ideals of this great nation. We give thanks for all those past and present who devote their lives in public service to preserve these ideals and who strive to transform and sustain this nation true to its founding vision of equity and justice for all. As today we honor the life and service of President John Quincy Adams, may we not forget how precious are the individual liberties and the institutions of representative government, which he did so much to sustain and fulfill through challenging times towards a larger vision of justice with the courage of his beliefs and the power of his actions. May our prayer today also be for our nation, for our president and Congress, and for all of us as citizens as we begin to emerge from this harsh pandemic while recognizing ongoing impact for many and continue to work toward fulfilling the promise of an America yet to be. Continue to grant us the wisdom to vote wisely to fulfill a promise of justice for all May we hold fast to the founding ideals of our country and the rule of law which make freedom possible. We pray also especially today for those in military service whose lives are in danger or challenged by other life circumstances. In these troubled times of continued economic distress for many, ongoing threats of violence to many, and the impact of climate crisis for all of us. May we ever remember that our nation's true strength is in the justice of its institutions, the character of its leaders, and the faithfulness of its citizens. Amen and blessed be. As we move into the speaker's portion of our program, it is my honor to welcome the mayor of our wonderful city of Quincy, the Honorable Tom Koch. Thank you, Jim. Reverend Clergy, Commander, distinguished guests, Madam President, Senator Keenan. It's an honor and privilege for me to bring the greetings of the city to this annual event. Jim mentioned uh, the book Profiles Encouraged by John Kennedy. Uh, Senator Adams at the time broke with the Federalist Party on two major issues. One was the Louisiana Purchase President Jefferson had just accomplished, and the other was the embargo on the British ships, which essentially led to his resignation for the Massachusetts Senate. 
He was a very complex individual, uh, widely noted as probably the highest IQ of any of the presidents. An incredible diplomat, ambassador, member of Congress, member of the Senate, and of course, the President of the United States. I recently read a book by William Cooper called The Lost Founding Father. Uh, if you're a J.Q. Adams fan, you should pick that book up. It's, it's pretty amazing. And uh, he, as I mentioned, he was a complicated figure, and later in his life, um, he was questioning some things, but what he learned pretty quickly as he started to travel around, which he didn't take that uh, pleasure too often in his life, but later in life he did that, and huge crowds welcomed him wherever he went. He was asked to speak at a number of locations. He was that last connection with the Founding Fathers. In fact, his funeral, the state funeral in D.C., nothing had been seen like it until Abraham Lincoln's funeral. So an incredible individual, a great American, a great patriot. And if there's anything we should learn, particularly in this day, is that in politics we should do the right thing, not the most expedient thing. So may God continue to bless this great country. And I see our veterans in front of us. We have veterans serving us all across the world as we sit here and enjoy these freedoms. May they God continue to bless our veterans. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mayor. Now, I'd like to invite President of the Quincy City Council, Nina Liang, to the podium. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Quincy City Council, it is an honor to be here with all of you today to celebrate the birthday of our very own John Quincy Adams. As we're finally getting back to being able to be together for these important occasions, it's hard not to reflect on what we've all been through in order to be here. Whether it was uncertainties with our children, our jobs, our faith, or our hope, the last year and a half has challenged us to weigh both sides of many difficult decisions. Sending our kids back to school, balancing returning to the workplace, standing up for social change, and creating safe ways to be with our loved ones again. And to ultimately take the leap of faith that the decision that we chose on many of these occasions was the right one. That leap of faith is courage. And in celebration of John Quincy Adams, it is what we pause to reflect on here today. Whether personally or professionally, each of us have been challenged throughout this pandemic to change and to adapt, to pivot and to grow, learning from our successes and our failures. And most importantly, finding the courage to continue moving forward despite all of the uncertainties. In facing a difficult decision, someone once said to me, this will not be the hardest thing that you'll face in your life. And sure enough, looking back, it wasn't. But we all know that pit in your stomach feeling, your heart beating in your throat, and I'm sure John Quincy Adams felt the same way, with his mentors, constituents, even his father, John Adams, pulling him in so many different directions with, when faced with difficult decisions. Ultimately, he made the decision to stand by his convictions and stand up for what he believed was what was gonna be for the common good. And in doing so, has truly defined what courage is, not just for those in public service, but for all of us who call Quincy home. He set the foundation for what our community represents, and as we celebrate his birthday today, let us remember the legacy that he leaves behind for all of us, to stand for what you believe in, to lead by example, and to demonstrate what it truly means to, be, to have courage and leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Now we hear from uh, Kelly Cobble from the Adams National Historic Park. Good afternoon, and uh, <clears throat> from the uh, National Park Service, I also welcome you today and to honor our sixth president of the United States, John Quincy Adams. And as we've heard, um, John F. Kennedy did sing out his praises, and I'll start with a quote, in whatever arena of life one may meet the challenge of courage, Whatever may be the sacrifices he faces, if he follows his conscience, the loss of his friends, his fortune, his contentment, even the esteem of his fellow men, each man must decide for himself the course he will follow. And as um, certainly Kennedy would include John Quincy in his book Profiles of Courage, I think he could have written a whole book entitled political coverage of the Adams family, but I might be a bit biased. I like to think the Adams's political courage was born right here and in the neighborhoods close by. 
The Adamses walked along this landscape, worshiped right in this area where we are today. John planted potatoes alongside his father, harvested corn on his property right up the road, and paid homage to his ancestors right across the park. Abigail kept the home fires burning and read letters from Papa to the children around the hearth. John Quincy helped with chores on the farm and planted trees for future generations. John's knowledge of right and wrong, tenacity and ambition sprung from this community where he was nurtured and educated by his honest father and kind mother. John set the bar high for John Quincy Adams, no doubt, from publicly opposing the Stamp Act to sacrificing his family life and career to serve as a delegate in the Continental Congress before sailing to Europe to negotiate peace and loans for our struggling country. John demonstrated his courage by speaking out and taking action against the political acts of the king that were inhibiting our rights. When he turned down a lucrative job as attorney general for the colony, swim or sink, live or die, survive or perish, I am with my country. You may depend upon it. And this was his ultimate response to his friend Jonathan Sewell in 1774. To know John Quincy, we only need to look at his parents. On the 4th of July, as we greeted folks who came by the park to soak up the essence of the day, we reflected on John and the courage that it took for him to continuously stand up to and with all of his peers, day after day, week after week, month after month, making the point that the time had come to break free and that we had the means to self-govern. And to self-govern, we had to live by a code of checks and balances to keep the level of power equal. All the while, under the cloak of treason, every day that they met. Abigail was a role model, encouraged as she managed the farm in John's presence, provided troops and refugees with food and supplies, sacrificed her heartstrings and a helping hand by sending her husband and eldest son across the ocean in treacherous conditions and into hostile and unfamiliar countries. She reared her son to be someone special and deserving of their sacrifices and courage. When she wrote to John Quincy when he was 12 years old and on his second voyage across the Atlantic, she advised his, her advice to him was, these are the times in which a genius would wish to live. It is not in the still calm of life or the repose of a Pacific station that great characters are formed. Would Cicero have shown so distinguished an order if he had not been roused, kindled, and inflamed by the tyranny of Cetalone, Milo, Verus, and Mark Antony? The habits of a vigorous mind are formed in contending with difficulties. She goes on. Great necessities call out great virtues. When a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities which other ways lay dormant wake into life and form the character of the hero in the statesman. She gives him a little credit. The strict and inviolable regard you have always paid to truth gives me pleasing hope that you will not swerve from her dictates, but add justice, fortitude, and every manly virtue which can adorn a good citizen. Do honor to your country and render your parents supremely happy, particularly your ever affectionate mother. <laughs> Have a good trip, dear. <clears throat> John Quincy followed the path his parents set out for him. It took courage to travel as a young boy to Europe with his father, experiencing different languages, attending foreign schools, traveling to Russia when he was only 14. Politics called and John Quincy answered out of a sense of duty. As he became an adult, he was called upon to represent the United States as a diplomat in several countries. It took courage to represent his country to foreign powers that had a long history and other agenda 
as well as suspicion of such a young country. But just as his father was the first representative to stand before the king, to whom he was no longer subjected, John Quincy Adams rose to the occasion. While serving the Senate, John Quincy made difficult decisions that were unpopular, but what he thought were good for the country. And as the mayor pointed out, he voted for the Louisiana Purchase, and he voted uh, for the embargo against Great Britain, against his constituents and his party. Adams was one of the greatest secretaries of state as he formulated the Monroe Doctrine and, re and de redefined our position in the world. On the 4th of July in 1821, he addressed Congress. America, with the same voice which spoke herself into existence as a nation, proclaimed to mankind the inextinguishable rights of human nature and the only lawful foundation of government. America, in the Assembly of Nations, since her admission among them, has invariably, though often fruitlessly, held forth to them the hand of honest friendship, of equal freedom, of generous reciprocity. She has uniformly spoken among them, though often to heedless and often to disdainful ears, the language of equal liberty, of equal justice, of equal rights. She was, in the lapse of nearly half a century, without a single exception, respected the independence of other nations while asserting and maintaining her own. As President, John Quincy set forth an ambitious agenda that included federally funded infrastructure projects, improving and creating roads and canals, establishing a national university, a naval academy, and support for further studies of arts and sciences. But many of his initiatives were defeated in Congress. He never lacked the courage to propose his ideals to improve this country and to bring forth the culture and the knowledge that he had acquired in Europe. John Quincy continued his efforts in Congress after his presidency to set forth his ideals of a national institution for the arts and sciences and in fighting to protect the bequest of James Smithson, he was able to help create America's greatest museum, the Smithsonian. John dedicated his life to creating and protecting laws that established our freedom and justice. Abigail encouraged him and advocated for education and protection. John Quincy took his parents' code another step forward in defending human rights. <clears throat> the human rights that had been laid out in the Declaration and Constitution. Like John's tenacity in the Continental Congress brought upon our independence, John Quincy's passionate 18-year effort contesting the gag rule finally nullified anti-slavery legislation in Congress. John Quincy's political courage was to ease the exploitation of slaves and Native Americans in this country. In defense of the Amistad case, John Quincy solidified his contribution to history as he argued before the Supreme Court that the Africans' rebellion was justified. They had been taken against their will. They had a right to fight for their freedom, just as we had. Because every person has the right to be free, he called out the president's abuse of power. He destroyed the argument that any treaty with a foreign country should override US principles of individual rights. John Quincy continued his battle to protect human rights and to eradicate slavery until he died in service at the Capitol in 1848. From a small boy witnessing the Battle of Bunker Hill right down the street to his patriotism of 70 years in public service ranks him one of our most courageous public servants in our country. And as the plaque above us states, John Quincy was a son worthy of his father, a citizen shredding, shedding glory on his country, a scholar ambitious to advance mankind. This Christian sought to walk humbly in the sight of God. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. 
And our final distinguished speaker from the Quincy Historical Society is Dr. Edward Fitzgerald. Find my glasses. Uh, good afternoon. In the introduction to his 1995 book, Arguing About Slavery, which is one of the first to concentrate on the congressional debates on the gag rule that Kelly just talked about, um, author William B. Lee Miller said that he had found a rather unlikely hero, those are his words, in John Quincy Adams. 26 years later, I don't think uh, anyone would have to explain Adams as an unlikely hero. Miller's book was the first of a flowering of books that have taken place over these last 25 years, in particular the last 10 or 15 years, in which uh, Adams is reevaluated, reaffirmed, raised to new stature. Uh, all these strategies recognize and most celebrate Adams' political courage. They all equally agree that Adams is a difficult man to figure out. And when you add the problems of what the nature of courage is, and then add to that the whole question of what constitutes political courage, you can wind up with a great deal of variations of opinion. What, there are all sorts of forms of courage that we can look for in Adams in various ways. His courage as a Secretary of State when he would go beyond receive the opinion, what we would now call con conventional wisdom, uh, to make bold diplomatic moves that strengthened and expanded the nation. Um, Fred Kaplan in his book even says that uh, Adams took the lead in getting the rules, the laws in Massachusetts against theatrical performances removed, so that took a certain kind of courage as well. But it's the two phases of his life that I think most people associate with courage is, are the case that the mirror mentioned, which was his support for the Jefferson embargo and the later end of his career fight against slavery when he returned as a congressman in the 1830s and the 1840s that Kelly talked about. So what I would like to do for just a couple of minutes is look at a couple of particular instances uh, with kind of a local slant that go to both of those phases of his life. And I'm turning to his diary, which um, most people consider a, a kind of masterpiece of American political writing. He kept, he kept a voluminous diary. It's, I think, something like 12 volumes um, throughout mo almost all of his life. Um, and it is the place where you see him not only at his most frank, but at his most complicated. Uh, so the embargo bill passed in December of two, 1807, Adams being one of the few Federalists to vote for it. He did so because he felt that whatever flaws Jefferson's idea of an embargo had, the president had to be supported in what he really saw as a moment of crisis, and because <clears throat> he felt that uh, we could not, under any circumstances, submit to Britain's essentially had, maintaining a tyranny over us on the high seas. But he also did so because he'd become increasingly concerned about that faction of the Federalist Party that, as they saw the rising tide of Jeffersonianism, he feared were willing to wreck the country in order to preserve their interests. So in February, after the, after the embargo has passed, Adams is still a senator, uh, but he's in political hot water at this point. And Josiah Quincy, his fellow Federalist, who was a member of the House of Representatives, comes to visit him. Probably not to get him, um, not to put pressure on him, but to kind of say, are you sure you want to go along with all these Jeffersonian Republicans? I mean, you, you shouldn't really trust them. So this is the way Adams describes the visit and his reaction to Quincy. Mr. Quincy asked me to, this is all in Washington, by the way. Mr. Quincy asked me to have some conversation with him, which I did at his chamber. He inquired into the motives of my late conduct in Congress, which I fully detailed to him, and they would not, <clears throat> He said, I should not trust the motives of the people that I had associated with, and they would not thank me for my actions. I told him that I did not want their thanks. He said they would not value me the more for them. I told him I cared not whether they valued me for them or not. 
my character, such as it was, must stand upon its own ground. I fully opened to him my motives for supporting the administration at this crisis and my sense of the danger which a spirit of opposition is bringing upon the Union, either in a civil war or in a dissolution of the Union with the Atlantic states in subservience to Great Britain, that to resist this, I was ready, if necessary, to sacrifice everything I have in life, even life itself. And then characteristically, he says, but we must wait with patience to see where the right is. Uh, I think there is very much distilled what most historians see as the core source of his ability to act with political courage, which is his commitment to the idea of the Union and the nature of what the Federal Union was and its respect increasingly for human rights. On the issue of his opposition to slavery, there has been more controversy. He, um, there are people who would say he, even though he came out for it in the end, uh, and turned and spoke by, uh, I'm sorry, and spoke eloquently as a congressman, that he was a little slow to do so. And there is some criticism that he did not move uh, fast enough as president. Um, most historians, however, I think would agree that what was really going on was that he was evolving. His views on this were evolving and that he was increasingly seeing slavery as the threat to the Union. He was increasingly seeing the actions of slaveholders as a threat to representative government and he was becoming increasingly aware of what slavery meant to an enslaved person. Uh, you see this gradually evolve in the diaries. You see it in, in various diary entries, very often indirectly. Very often he's not really hitting it on it. Even to himself, he's not really hitting it on it. But I think one of the earliest instances of this taking place is in an entry he made in which he wrote a poem. He, he wrote poems throughout his life. This is a poem that um, our friend Jim Cook would often recite at these wreath layings for John Adams' uh, birthday. And the circumstances in which he wrote it are very interesting, I think at least. He's writing in his diary, he writes it on October 30th, 1826, which is the first birthday of John Adams after John Adams has passed away. He's actually just back for a few weeks in the capital from uh, being here in Quincy taking care of his father's estate. He is still, of course, President of the United States. and. Um, he records the poem in his diary, but he records it in shorthand. And uh, he, used a, he had a private shorthand that it's taken people ages to try and, and decipher. He said, I took a walk this morning around the Capitol. This is the result of the meditations of my morning's walk. I record it thus, in other words, in shorthand, that it may be legible only to myself, he's being very careful, or to a reader who will take the trouble to pick it out of the shorthand. If it were better poetry, I would have written it at full length. Well, in fact, it's as good poetry as he ever wrote. Um, I won't try and read it because I'm not in Jim Cook's league, but I will give you a few lines from it. Uh, he begins by noting that it's the day of his father's birth, and though his father is gone, his spirit essentially lives on. And he finds that spirit in a particular way. He says, where on earth's wide ball shall man be met while time shall run but from thy, in other words, his father's spirit brave, shall learn to grasp the boon his maker gave and spurn the terror of a tyrant's threat. Who but shall learn that freedom is the prize man still is bound to rescue or maintain, that nature's God commands the slave to rise and on the oppressor's head to break his chain. Roll years of promise, rapidly roll round, till not a slave shall on this earth be found. In, yet in code, placed in code in his, uh, in his diary. Not quite yet ready to let that loose upon the world, but he is finding here the language that becomes the language of uh, John Quincy Adams' congressman in just a couple of years. Uh, it's the language in which he sees America as a universal symbol of freedom, in which he sees uh, the American system in which he sees the roots of our core American documents because this is all based on John Adams' role in creating the Declaration of Independence and its principles 
as universal. It's what keeps him within the bounds of working within a governmental system when other opponents of slavery are talking about the destruction of the Constitution, the destruction of the United States. Uh, and it gives him a language that allows for a discussion of slavery within and a discussion of freedom within those limits of the American system. I would finally point out that um, for a man who risked his career at least two or three times on his principles, he did very well. Uh, he, after he was booted out by the Federalists from the Senate, uh, less than a year later, President Madison was appointing him minister to Russia, and that was going to launch his career that would eventually make him the greatest Secretary of State in history. Um, after an unsuccessful presidency, his advocacy as a congressman made him, as the mayor pointed out, uh, universally admired, at least in the northern states, so that no one before Lincoln had a funeral or in a period of national mourning like John Quincy Adams did, which suggests that uh, acting from political courage may not, in fact, be politically fatal. And uh, Adams himself, I think, realized that late in his life. He said, I've had a life of very terrible ups and downs, but on the whole, I think it has been good. And I would just conclude with biographer Robert Remini's comments upon that last uh, remark by Adams. Remini was actually primarily known as a biographer of Adams's great rival, Andrew Jackson. Uh, but Remini greatly admired Adams as he wrote about him. And like, unlike a number of other Adams biographers, he had a sense of humor. So his last words about John Quincy Adams are, the respect and admiration Americans had for him and what he accomplished during his lifetime have mounted over the years and will undoubtedly keep mounting into the future. Surely now he feels completely vindicated. Thank you. Now I ask Lieutenant Commander Monica Johnson to come forward to lead us through the laying of the presidential wreath. Thank you. Post. Okay, guests, if you would remain seating up here and distinguished guests, follow us down to the crypt. On behalf of the President of the United States and a great nation, I present the presidential birthday wreath. Happy birthday, John Quincy Adams. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Let's pause for a moment in prayer, in silent prayer, in gratitude and blessings for the life that role modeled such great political courage throughout. Blessed be, amen. Thank you. 
Thank you, Norman. And uh, now uh, I would ask for our UFPC church historian, Bill Westland, to come forward and give us some closing remarks. Back in 1962, President Lyndon Johnson, by presidential order, declared that on the birthday of every deceased ex-president, there would be a wreath laid in the name of the current president. And so we have been doing it here ever since. And from the very beginning, the Navy has always represented the president. Because of course, John Adams was president when the Navy was officially formed. John Quincy Adams, from the time he was Secretary of State, was a big supporter of the Navy. And on top of that, when you think about it, Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Bush Sr. all served in the United States Navy. And on top of that, Charles Francis Adams III was the Secretary of Navy during the Hoover administration. So there always has been uh, that sort of, I guess you'd call it, uh, connection. And you've heard an awful lot about John Quincy Adams. And I thought maybe I could sum up his life in just three brief quotes. And President Martin Van Buren was a political opponent of John Quincy Adams for a long time. But this is what he said about him. Mr. Adams was an honest man, loved his country, and desired to serve it usefully and had the honor of doing so. William Parsons Mutt, Lutt I should say, was our minister and gave the funeral service of John Quincy Adams. In fact, the plaque, the Reverend Lunt is in the back there. And this is what he said. Where in history can you find such a glorious destiny assigned to a single life? But probably the best thing is this one quote from John Quincy Adams himself. Something that maybe we all should think about now. He said, always vote for principles. Though you may vote alone, you may cherish the reflections that your vote is never lost. Something that we all should remember now. I want to thank you all for being here. And we are proud that John Quincy Adams was a member of the church. So happy birthday to John Quincy Adams. And if anybody wants to go and see the crypt and also the wreath, the guides will take you down after the ceremony. So I'll turn that thing over now to Reverend Walsh. Thank you everyone for attending today. You've heard quotes given by John Quincy Adams today, and I have one that you actually haven't heard as yet that I take as the inspiration for my benediction today, and one that you have heard today that I think also is useful for us to end with today. So from President John Quincy Adams, courage and perseverance have a magical talisman before which difficulties disappear and obstacles vanish into air. And the one which you heard with which we began, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. So may it always be. Amen and blessed be. Well, thank you for letting us attend. I appreciate it.
Now we will retire the colors.